All right. So, hello everybody. Welcome to lecture seventeen of quantum computation. Um, is my voice clear? Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you. Um, so, in uh, yesterday's lecture, in lecture sixteen, so I had talked. Uh, you know, I had started to go into the details of uh, this uh, quantum Fourier transform, but and and I had given you, a, I think, a fairly decent explanation. But I think a lot of subtlety still remain. And what is missing is a a proper derivation, which doesn't leave any doubt for ambiguity. Okay, so I have sat down and worked it out. and it's actually much more intricate than one might think and there are a few steps in there which are very which are not very obvious and uh, and anyways hopefully uh, this lecture will be the definitive introduction to the quantum fourier transform uh, at least one might hope so so now i will start again And go step by step, and and uh, show you uh, how to obtain uh, the optimized circuit. <laughs> Excuse me. Okay, so let's uh, write write down the Fourier transform again. Right, we have a set of uh, computational basis states. Uh, these basis states. so okay and well how many qubits so okay for that let's first state how many qubits we have uh we have uh n qubits okay and that means our state space is 2 and 2 to the n small n dimensional state space okay and we'll write that as capital n also sometimes So, what is the statement of the this Fourier transform? You get one by root n uh, summation over k. And now, um, in yesterday's lecture, I used uh, the numbering for numbering qubits. Sometimes I used uh, a convention where I was going from from zero to n minus one. Uh, today, I'm going to Change that and use the dip convention uh, where I um, label the qubits from one to n. Okay, and anyway, this this happens all the time. One has to get used to it, so it's not. Uh, and so uh, along the way, we will need a couple of useful expressions. So if you have any any number. you can write it in in its binary form in this way right where uh, these respective positions uh, determine uh, the significance of the digit right so this expression for instance becomes Right, two to the n minus two, k one to k minus two, which I can write as l is equal to uh, one to to n k l two to the n minus l. This convention will uh, will save us some trouble going, you know, a little bit later. So the Fourier transform uh, takes the form. and since we are numbering the states starting from 1 okay so we go from 1 to how many states are there there are 2 uh, to the n uh, right uh, oh no no sorry sorry yeah so okay so we are numbering a qubits um, from 1 to n but we are numbering our states so we have our state space our state space uh is numbered from uh 0 to 2 to the n minus 
Okay. So we have a sum over all the states. We have this factor omega, right? What is omega? 2 pi i j times k, right? Uh, and then divided by uh, n. What is n? Capital N, the total dimension of the state space times k. Right? So this is the statement of the Fourier quantum Fourier transform. Okay. So now let's uh, simplify this. Well, it's a simplification, even though it might not seem like it. So first of all, uh, this N, this capital N in the denominator in this exponent, uh, we will write as two to the n, okay? That, that's what it is. So this becomes exponent two pi i j two to the n, okay? Now you will notice one thing that I gave this uh, binary expansion for k, right? Over here, so let me, Uh, write it down again, right? And so this implies that if I take k and divide by two to the n, I get l is equal to one to n, k l divided by two to the l, right? So this factor of two to the n over here cancels out. That is one reason for this, for this, uh, for this convention. Okay, so I'll just put that in brackets. All right, now the next step. So what have you done with J, like the first step? Of J? We have not done anything with J. J right now is just uh, one take some value from zero to two, uh, zero to two to the small n minus one. Okay, we have not done anything with j. So that j qubit. Uh, hmm? So that j qubit, uh, you have. Uh, uh, you have written that uh, j. This one. Yes. Yes. Sir. Yeah. So we have not done anything. Uh, you. You. You should you should think of this as the J of the Fourier transform basis, J tilde, okay? And this, and this, this J just labels the, gives you an index, okay? Is this fine? Yes, sir. Yeah, please make sure that you understand uh, all the steps. So K otherwise. was our initial basis. Uh, yeah. So K is our, our computational basis, and the tilde ones are the Fourier basis, the transform basis. Okay. All right. So now we take this expression, right, and put this into our exponential over here, right? And so this becomes, so I'll write this as J tilde, let's say. N by two k is equal to zero to n minus one, and um, then I have exponent two pi i j sum of l is equal to one to n k l two to the l times k. Okay. Now this k. Right. What is it? I can write it as k1, k2, kn in the binary notation, right? So this, this thing becomes one over two to the n by two. K is equal to zero 
and i'm i'm going uh, the tedious way uh, repeating uh, not skipping any steps because i you know because if you skip steps in this case it's easy to get lost at least it is for me so this k is k1 k2 till kn right and now if you look at uh, if you look at this expression right what is this expression you have a sum over here right so again this expression becomes right exponent 2 pi i j i can write it as k1 by 2 right and then k1 tensor exponent 2 pi i j k2 by 2 tensor k2 and so on right so till tensor exponent j2 by i j by one second one second ha huh? one second Ah uh, yeah, go ahead. What what uh, what were you saying? K two by two to the power. Ah, K two by two to the power. Two square. Yeah. Okay. So this expression can now be written as J to the one over two to the n by two. summation of k is equal to 0 2 to the n minus 1 right and then i'll put this tensor product l is equal to 1 to n okay and then i'm taking this tensor product of this object 2 pi i j k l over 2 to the l k l okay so i hope everybody is comfortable with this expression at this stage right this this basis state right this is in the binary right so if i have a state like this what is this this is just 1 tensor 0 tensor 1 right that's all i'm doing okay now we take this expression this sum of k going from 0 to 2 to the n minus 1 right so what is this k k is the number right so for instance if you have four qubits this goes from 0 1 2 3 4 till 15 right so this this thing can be written in terms of the binary right so for instance when i say sum of k goes from 0 to um, let me say for for three qubits it goes from 0 to 7 right another way to write it is that the same expression is in this way right k1 k2 and k3 what are these these are the the three bits right so as i sum over k1 is equal to 0 1 k2 is equal to 0 1 and k3 is equal to 0 1 i am summing over all the possible values of 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 the number k right okay so i had explained this yesterday i hope that uh, you have retained that um, so this becomes k1 is equal to 0 to 1 uh, then uh, kn is equal to 0 1 right so we substitute this expression back in our previous line and we get till the j 1 by 
2 to the n by 2. Okay. Summation of k1 is equal to 0, 1, k2 is equal to 0, 1, kn is equal to 0, sorry, 1. Then tensor product L is equal to 1 to n. Exponent 2 pi i j k L by 2 to the L. Okay, now, and the next step is uh, the following. I interchange the order of the tensor product and the summation. Okay, so I put the summation outside, L goes from one to N. Okay, and now I will write write out an expression and uh, I hope that uh, we will be able to see why this expression makes sense. 2 pi i j k to the l over 2 to the l. Okay. So my, what I'm claiming is that these two expressions are the same, right? That this expression is the same as this expression, right? And I hope that, so why is this the case, right? Because see, here you are taking a tensor product, right, of a sum. So when you, when you take this tensor product, right, what will you get? You will get, uh, you will get exactly this expression. You can convince yourself that this is the case. Uh, for instance, you can just work with uh, with two with two qubits. Okay, so for n is equal to two, and just expand both sides and see that they are the same. All right. So I will leave it at that. I'm not going to go into this in in more detail. Now this expression. Now this expression in the in the curly braces can be simple. It becomes simple. Why? Because we have this sum. So let's set KL is equal to zero. If you set KL is equal to zero, I get zero. What happens to the phase angle? The phase angle is just one, right? Because here I have KL is equal to zero. This phase angle becomes one, right? And then when KL is equal to one, what do I get? I get exponent two pi i j, right? And KL is equal to one divided by two to the L one. And I put a subscript L here to indicate that I'm talking about the Lth qubit, right? So what is this? This is a, this is a tensor product state now. Right? This is a tensor product state. It looks like this. The first qubit, there's an exponent 2 pi ij uh, by 2 phase. Uh, then tensor 0, 2 e to the 2 pi ij uh, by 4. The second qubit. Right till the nth qubit, like this. To the two pi i j by two to the n. Okay, so this is this is a this is our tensor product structure. But we are not done yet. Okay. Uh, wh why is that? The, why is that the case? We still have some simplification left. And this is this is the where the subtlety comes in. Remember that in this exponent we have this we have this j divided by two to the l, right? And now somebody was asking what happens to the j, right? 
well you remember that j can also be written in the binary right so j let's write j in this way right it's also an it can be written in, in the binary like this right so what is this expression it's the same expression uh, that we had for k uh, in the binary right it's this only with j instead of k okay right and let me um, let me just write out the terms explicitly um you will get j1 times 2 to the n minus 1 j2 times 2 to the n minus minus 2 so on till j2 Times two to the two. Sorry, j two times two to the one. Ah, uh, no, no, no. Sorry. Once again, again, I also get lost. That's why I'm saying that it's it's, it's tricky. At least for me, it's tricky. I don't know about about you all. Ah, uh, but it's right. j and minus one. Yeah, I yeah, got it. Got it. Got it. Ah. Uh, Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, 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 sorry. J n minus one and J n. That's right. That's right. That's right. Thanks. I'm just checking that you are paying attention. So J n minus one, two to the n plus J n two to the zero. Okay. Now, what happens when I divide this by two to the l? Okay. So I can write this expression as follows. I can write it as two to the n minus one. and then what will happen is i will reach a point right where i will get a uh, some uh, number m and 2 to the n minus m okay where n minus m is equal to l all right and then the remainder so so what does what what does this give me okay so so for uh, to help us understand this let us look at decimal numbers okay so i have some number right say 2430 right i divide 2430 by 10 to the 2 what am i left with i am left with 24 decimal 30 right similarly if you take your j1 to jn right and divide by 2 to the l right what will happen you will get a decimal point right what will happen this last term this last term will become jn divided by 2 to the l then jn minus 1 2 to the l minus 1 right so you can write it as j1 uh till uh j uh l plus 1 decimal jl Wait, wait again let me let me refer to my notes that's why i i i took some serious notes a little bit earlier um right okay yeah so this is this is what's going on so if you take j and divide by l right you will get a decimal point here 
and this decimal point will lie at n minus in, in the boundary between n minus l and n minus l plus. So just like if you take any two, four, three, four, five, okay, and I divide by uh, ten to the ten to the three, right? What do I get? I get two four dot three four five. Now there are n digits here, right? How many digits are left to the left of the decimal point? N minus three. How many digits are left to the in right of the decimal point? Uh, N uh, L uh, three digits are left, right? So that is what we have here. Here we have to the left of the decimal point we have n minus l digits and how many point digits do we have here here we have l digits okay now okay going back okay And if, if any of you like, you know, understands this right away and it's very obvious to you, uh, that's wonderful. Uh, but for me, <laughs> it's not so obvious. So I have to go slowly. Okay. So I get this expression when I take J divided by two. Now we come to this exponent. We have this exponent two pi i j divided by, uh, divided by two to the L, okay? So I can write this as exponent two pi i, right? J over two to the L, I can write it like this. Exponent two pi i, J one, J two, J n minus L, right? Plus two pi i, zero dot, right? So binary decimal, j to the n, j n minus l plus one till j n, right? So if you're working with, uh, for instance, if you're working with, uh, with base 10, what would, what would this correspond to, right? So you have j divided by 10 to the, 10 to the l, right? So you have j one, till uh, j n minus l, right? Plus the decimal point where there will be l significant digits. Uh, is this clear to everybody? Okay. So now this quantity, what is this? This is an integer, right? This is an integer, let's call it p. So what happens to our phase factor? Our phase factor becomes two pi i j over two to the L exponent two pi i times an integer p times exponent two pi i. And then this decimal, this binary decimal. And what is this phase factor equal to? What is this exponent of two pi i p equal to? Where p is an integer? Uh, sir, it's a one. One, sir. No, sir. At one, one. It's one, right? So this, so this expression here, right? can be uh, written as follows. So I get tilde j is equal to um, this object, right? And I can write that as one. So one over two to the n by two. First qubit, I get exponent 
2 pi i, right? 0 dot L is equal to 1. Okay, so which qubit do I get? I, I get um, n minus 1 plus 1. So I get Jn. 0 dot Jn 1. This is the first term. Tensor, the second term is 0, second qubit, exponent 2 pi i. Okay, 0 dot. I will get one more entry here, right? I'll get Jn minus 1 and J. Right? And then 1 and the second qubit. Right? And in this way, I can I can write this as a so finally I'll I'll end up with this expression. This is the final expression. Well, this is not the final expression, but this is what will allow us to build our circuit. So up till this point, I hope that you all have been able to follow. If you have gotten lost at some point, please let me know. Okay. So now here comes the interesting part, right? How do we build up this state? So let's start with, remember, what are we trying to do? We are trying to perform a Fourier transform on the state which was given by this, which was given by this, uh, by this J, right? So our, our initial state is specified in terms of n qubits, where each qubit is in the J1, J2 states respectively. Okay? Now, the first step is to act on the first qubit with a Hadamard. All right. What does the Hadamard do? If you take the Hadamard and you act on J1, you will get a superposition, which can be written like this. 0 plus exponent 2 pi i and um, by i again let me just quickly uh, yeah these indices become hard easy to uh, lose track of 2 pi i 0 dot j1 times 1 so this here exponent 2 pi i 0 dot j1 1. And again, you can convince yourself that this is correct because if j1 is equal to 0, right, the phase factor here 0 dot j1 is just 0. So the phase factor is 1, right? And so you end up with 0 plus 1 by root 2. And if J1 is equal to one, then this phase factor, this is 0 0.1. What is 0 0.1 in binary? It is, in binary, it is one half, right? One by two. So your phase factor is two pi i divided by two. Your, it becomes pi i, exponent pi i is minus one, and you get zero. Okay, so what I have shown is that the action of the Hadamard gate on the first qubit can be expressed in this notation. Okay, and now you might see that, well, there's a certain picture that is sort of starting. Here to that emerge. phase factor is along which axis? 
what do you mean by access uh, like sir i meant uh, you took j equal to 0 and j equal to 1 so j1 yes sir j1 is equal to 0 and j1 equal to 1 so, so are... if j1 is equal to 0 right what what i'm telling you is that this notation so you I, i'm showing you that this notation is consistent so if j1 is equal to 0 what should be the hardamard on 0 it should give you 1 by root 2 0 plus 1 right for the first qubit so i'll put an extra one here just to indicate that i'm talking about the first qubit okay and if j1 is equal to 1 i should get 1 by root 2 minus right yes no yes sir uh -huh. Right. Now this phase factor exponent two pi i zero dot j one. What is this equal to? When j one is equal to zero, this phase factor is equal to one. Right. Its exponent zero is equal to one. When j one is one. Okay, when J1 is one, that is this case, what is this phase factor equal to? It's equal to exponent two pi i divided by two, which is equal to minus one. So I have two cases, right? J1 can either be zero or one. In the first case, the Hadamard should give me this state, the plus state. In the second case, it should give me the minus state, right? What I'm showing you is that this, these, both of these can be written in this compact way. Sir, do you mind showing it in the sec for the second qubit as well? No, I, <laughs> we're, not, we're not going to the second qubit right now. Just hold on a second. First you, first, you just understand that the Hadamard is doing this for the first qubit. We are going to stick with the first qubit only for a while now. Like This point should be clear to you, okay? Well, I hope it's clear, okay. Now, the next step is the following. After we apply this Hadamard, to the first qubit, then we act on the first qubit with a rotation R2, which depends on the value of the second qubit, okay? So this is a controlled rotation. Now, first of all, what is this rotation? We'll write RK is equal to zero, one, exponent 2 pi i divided by 2 to the k. Okay. I, and I mean, here, uh, going back here, right? I mean, maybe you guys are, are getting confused. Remember that what is zero point anything? In If I have zero point, um, x, y, z. What is this? This is x by 2, y by 4, plus z by 8, right, in binary. And in decimal, it would be x by 10, y by 100, z by 1000, right? So that's all I'm doing here when I'm writing point decimal j1, right? What is decimal j1? Decimal j1 is j1 by 2 and when j1 is 0 it is 0 when j1 is equal to 1 i get 1 by 2 okay 
anyways so coming to this rotation this rotation is given by this expression okay so how does this rotation act right on the zero state it doesn't do anything on the one state it multiplies it by a factor of 2 pi i by 2 okay and what is the purpose of this rotation the purpose is the following coming back to this expression this this factorized expression right what we want is we want to construct a state of this form okay how do you construct a state of this form well first you apply this hardamard applying this hardamard gives you point decimal j1 right applying the controlled uh, this thing this controlled expression so if i apply i will write it as cr2 right cr2 acting on j1 will give me 1 by root 2 right and remember that what is j1 j1 was this zero plus this this phase right so i'll get zero but this phase will only act on the second qubit right so i'll get zero exponent 2 pi i 0 dot j1 right i already had that and then i am multiplying it by this phase factor r2 right what is r2 so i get an exponent 2 pi i by 2 to the 2 right times 1 okay vinay rohan are you guys with me yes sir yes sir now this phase factor is act will act only when j2 is equal to 1 right now when i say 2 to the 2 what does that correspond to that corresponds to the second significant digit right so i can write this as 0 0.0 j2 here in the first place i have point j1 and the second term gives me point 0 j2 so my net expression becomes two pi i 0 dot j1 j2 and the presence of this j2 ensures that this is it is a controlled rotation why because if j2 is zero right then my phase is not affected right nothing happens the control is zero if j2 is one then my one my one state is multiplied by this phase factor right so in this expression, if you put J2 is equal to one, what do you get? You get precisely this phase factor, right? You get one by four, right? One by two to the two, this is the phase factor. Okay. Once you understand this part, then the next part I think is a little bit easier to follow. Controlled rotation, R3, and it uh, just let me specify it is con this one is controlled by the second qubit this is controlled by the third qubit acting on acting on this state now acting on the state that we get from this so i act on uh, so i should say i act on hardamard j1 so even the above one it should be c2 r2 yeah H, yeah, yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. right what is this going to be any guesses well no prize for correct answers one maybe j1 below to j3 
j two j exactly two pi i zero point j one j two j three. I told you, <laughs> this one is a tricky fellow, right? This Fourier transform, right? So you see that we are getting closer to building up this state, right? So how how do I get this state now? I keep acting with the controlled rotation, right? So now let's look at our circuit. I have J one, Hadamard. J2, I put R2 controlled by J2, R3 controlled by J3, right? And so on until Rn, right? Controlled by which one? By Jn. Right? When I have done this, what is the end result? The end result is the state uh, one by root two, zero plus exponent two pi i zero dot j one j two till j n times one. This is my state, right? So I have succeeded in building up. I have succeeded in building up this expression but there is one small issue this expression is acting on the this is this is the last qubit right but here i have built up this expression on the first qubit right so what will need to happen is that later we will need to swap the qubits and now uh, let me just show you the circuit because that which is drawn in uh, the textbook. It's, uh, certainly uh, simpler, uh, easier to understand when you look at it like this. So this is the circuit. You start with J1, R R2 till Rn. Right, what does this do? This constructs your state zero plus two pi i zero dot j one j n till one. Right, and what about the all the other states? Remember that all the other states at this point are still in this tensor product j two j j three j n. Nothing has been these states have not been affected because this is a control. Right, nothing is happening to the control. But now we come to J2 and again, we repeat the procedure. We apply the Hadamard. We apply R2, R3 again. Till what? Till Rn minus one. Why till Rn minus one? Well, because there are only N minus one qubits, right? That are left, right? Here, you could go till N, but for the second qubit, uh, one line has been removed, right? So you're left with Rn minus one. What does this give you? This gives you decimal J2, J, Jn, right? In this way, you construct all of these states, right? You guys following? And once yes. you have built this the, these states, now, you need to reverse the order of the qubits because uh, in a Fourier transform, this is in the acting on the, this phase is act, acting on the last qubit. But in the state that we have just constructed over here, this phase in the, is in the first qubit. So what do I do? I put in a swap k. I swap the first qubit and the nth qubit. So let me show you, uh, yeah, this one. This is, a, this is the same circuit, slightly different representation. This is from uh, Thomas Wong. 
So Thomas Wong uses a different uh, convention. He numbers his qubits zero to n minus one. But as you can understand by now, it doesn't matter, right? The procedure is the same. Hubbard, this uh, Hardamard R2 till Rn, Hardamard R2 till Rn minus one and so on. And now when you're finally finished with this, what do you do? You swap all the, all the qubits. So if you have four qubits, you swap uh, first and second, first and fourth and second and third, like this, right? So for n is equal to four qubits, what does your circuit look like? This is your circuit for a Fourier transform. Now let's count the number of a number of gates in this Fourier transform in this in this circuit. One, uh, how many single qubit gates are there? One, two, three, four. There are four single qubit gates. And how many two qubit gates are there? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, right? So there are four single qubit gates and eight two qubit gates, right? Now, so if you, if you calculate all the number of gates and so on and so forth, you get this kind of a runtime, order of log square n. Okay, what is uh, the meaning of this logs? Let me actually again go back to Nielsen in this case. Uh, Nielsen is uh, right. So this circuit provides a order n square, where n is the number of qubits, right? But the fast Fourier transform, right? The fast Fourier transform is the fastest known classical algorithm. This uses order of n to the times two to the n gates, right? Now you can see that n square is exponentially less than n times two to the n, right? Right, so it requires exponentially more operations to compute the Fourier transform on a classical computer than it does to implement the Fourier transform on a quantum computer. But here comes a caveat. At face value, this sounds terrific, right? Right, because the Fourier transform is there in, is in there in so many applications, right? Speech processing, image processing, every, anything, right? But the problem is that in the quantum Fourier transform, there is no known way uh, because uh, the problem is that the amplitudes, right? The amplitudes which you actually need, they cannot directly be accessed by measurement, right? I mean, you can access the amplitudes, you can measure the amplitude of one qubit, but if you do that, the state of all the others collapses, right? So there is no way of determining the Fourier transformed amplitudes of the original state. And then there's another problem. There is no general way to determine to efficiently prepare the initial state. Okay. So there are lots and lots of caveats. Okay. But the Fourier transform is an essential uh, goal. It's an essential, uh, sorry, step in what is called phase estimation. And phase estimation is an essential step in uh, quantum search algorithms, okay, such as Grover's, Grover's algorithm. So you should think of this QFT as a subroutine, right, which you use to construct other uh, modules, other routines, okay. And this here is an example of the Fourier transform for uh, three qubits, okay? So you have the Hardamard, then you have R2. Now R2 um, is simply this, this S gate, which is a phase gate. So we should, we should see this page. Let me go to this page. 
Now go to the page twenty. One, two, three. Yes, one second. Okay, well, you can look up whatever this gate is. It, it, it's the pi by four gate, basically. It multiplies by pi by four. And this is the T gate is the multiplies by pi by eight. So you get S gate, you get a T gate, and that's it. Then you move on to the second qubit, you apply a harder mod. What can you do here? Well, you can only apply an S gate. You can only apply pi by four rotation. You run out of options. Then you come to the third qubit. The third qubit, all you can do is apply a harder mod and you're done. And then finally you have to swap. Now here you, have, you can swap the first and last qubits. And when you swap that, you're done. Right, because the middle qubit remains unchanged. So this is the the quantum Fourier transform, and uh, again, uh, this is wait one second. Where am I? Yeah, this is the QIS kit um, chapter on on the on this. So now going through all of these, after going through all of these details, this circuit should become more transparent to you, right? Hardamard control rotations, N minus one control rotations, then Hardamard again, N minus two control rotations and so on, and then swapping everything. Oops, sorry about that, right? So as an example, right? This is the three qubit, QFT, and I would uh, suggest uh, that you work out uh, this explicitly. Okay. And then, of course, there is a QIS kit implementation, uh, which uh, we will perhaps look at, but I'm not sure if you will look at it or not. But if you look at this implementation, what does it do? Well, it does exactly what the circuit is supposed to do. Hard mod, then rotation by uh, this, this uh, what is this P pi by two? One second, let me just make sure that I know what I'm talking about. Um, C P C pi by two. Right, so this corresponds to a phase angle of pi by four, actually. And then this corresponds to a phase angle of pi by eight. So, and then hard mod, then one more rotation, control rotation, then hard mod, and then a swap. So this builds your circuit. That's it. So you can construct a, a, a subroutine, a function, which uh, builds this circuit, right? And then, well, then you can uh, you can uh, you can run it. Uh, now, there is one interesting aspect of building this circuit, okay? And this is a computational aspect, which is the fact that when you want to build a circuit of this form, you have to use a recursive uh, method. So you have this QFT rotation, right? This function, and you see this function, it calls itself, right? So this is a recursive function. Why is, it, why is, why is this recursion required? Because you can look at the structure of this uh, of this circuit, right? It's it's got a nested structure. First you act on this, then you act on this, then you act on this, then you act on this. You don't have to use a recursive uh, logic. You can do it uh, with some kind of for loop also. The recursive logic is just a little bit more elegant. That's why. Right? Okay. So I will stop here for today. And I think I've completed everything in time without running over, right? Um, questions? Questions, questions, any questions?
in that last part uh, is the order of control not a uh, controlled rotation mandatory like uh, uh, in the first case where you showed the example the order is from j2 to jn and in the uh, last part here in Q qs kit it's from jn to j2 yeah so it do it doesn't really matter right i mean it, do, it doesn't it doesn't make any difference which qubit you consider your first one which qubit you consider your last one it doesn't it doesn't make any difference okay right the state remains the same and uh, you know and so you 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 could you could you could start with the hardamart acting on the first state and then go down this way or you can start here and then go down up this way okay another reason for this is because uh, if you look at if you look at the structure of these uh, these states right the binary structure right they they are they are symmetric right so for instance if you have a if you look at four qubits if you have a state 1100 you also have a state 0011 right so 1100 would correspond to um 12 and 0011 would correspond to 3 right in the in, in terms of integers but these two states are mirror copies of each other right you can just swap those qubits and you will get the state right one second i'm getting a call yeah any other questions uh, sir, so it is very important that we ensure that all the qubits are not entangled, right? Like if there is, there is some kind of entanglement. Ha, Rohan, sorry about that. Uh, sort of phone call, yeah. So not Rohan, we need. We need, we need, we need. Sorry, we need. Yeah, so it is important that we ensure that there is no, no any kind of entanglement between the qubits, right? Because if there is entanglement, the control bit also vary. Ah, yes, yes, yes. Otherwise, you would have the phase kickback. Yeah. You will have this phase yes, kickback, right? The Deutsch Chitra what algorithm, yeah. yeah. Deutsch Joseph, yeah. yeah. Exactly. But I mean, the thing is that, see, even if there is an entanglement, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't matter. I mean, because see, this, this Fourier transform, right? It's a, it's a standalone block. Your input state can be anything. In all of this uh, discussion, we have shown what happens if your input state is one of the basis states. Right, right. But the linearity of quantum mechanics tells us that uh, we can take any uh, state which is a superposition of all the basis states, right, or some superposition of the basis states. This block, this quantum Fourier transform block, will act on it and give you some output, right. So you can take a Fourier transform of any state. Now. Uh, so, if you take a Fourier transform of, of a state which has entanglement between qubits, you will probably get some interesting results. Okay, you will you will get something interesting, and that is probably been the subject of uh, research by other people, by many people. I, but I'm not aware of um, the precise details. Okay, Such. yeah. Sir, can we say that Fourier transform is just tells about how the our qubit evolves with time? Say that again. Fourier transform just tells about how the qubit is uh, evolved with time. 
this is just well, well in this case right but in this case see there is no uh, we don't um but yeah, you can you you, yeah. you right you, uh, okay one second you can you can uh, you can actually make that argument okay so let me uh, let me show that that's a good point uh, let me uh, well let, let us look at what happens uh, is what you're saying right so let's say that uh, you have some hamiltonian okay and uh, it has some eigenstates right n goes from 1 to n capital n is the number of number of states in your hilbert space right so you take some arbitrary state right which is some superposition of your eigenstates right so let's ask what happens to this state under time evolution right so what is time evolution the time evolution operator is this is the time evolution operator right yes this this guy acting on phi right what does it give us it gives us summation of cn right and when this operator will act on each of the basis states what will happen you'll get this eigen value of that state en right in the exponential psi n right um now um let's keep uh, let, let's say that our eigen values are are equally spaced okay just for the sake of the discussion so that means uh, your smallest eigen value is let's say e1 and then uh, e2 is equal to 2e1 and so on okay and then let's look at this phase factor this phase factor for a particular value of en right so en can be written as some n times e0 so this becomes e to the minus t n times e not by h bar right which can be written as exponent minus i t e not by h bar to the power n right and this expression i can write as some omega t right to the power n what is omega t omega t is this this a uh, quantity in my this phase back right so now if i look at this um the time evolution of my of my state what do i get i get something which looks superficially similar to the fourier transform right i get something like cn then this omega t to the power n acting on psi n right this is this was somewhat superficially similar to what i had for my fourier transform so if i go back uh, right as an example right let's look at this this three qubit transform this three, three qubit transform what is what is it this is the first state right? this is the first trans transform state this is the second fourier state how can we uh, look at these states and make some sort of comparison uh, with this with this time evolved pitch right right how can we do that well if you put t is equal to 0 right mm -hmm. if you put t is equal to 0 what will you get you will get this guy this yes, right all the phase factors will be be 
right? And then this will be for some t is equal to delta t, whatever, some, let me write t naught or something like that, right? Where this t naught, right? Because this, uh, this whole thing has to, you know, be some face, uh, some, some integer number, I think, okay? So you you will you will need that uh, this t has to be something like uh, h bar by e naught or something like that. So I mean, of course this is, this is this is very vague, but you can sort of see uh, that uh, there is a certain way, there is a certain sense in which you can view the the Fourier transform as describing the time evolution of your system right and that's that that's what that's what fourier transform does right yes sir can we conclude here uh, it doesn't affect the bell state also it is just time evolution of the state. sorry this doesn't affect the bell state we can take a bell state and take a fourier transform of bell state this doesn't affect uh, any correlation why 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 will it not affect the bell state because sir it's just a uh, uh, time evolution of the system no but i didn't i didn't say that it is the time evolution i am just making a very rough analogy and this analogy is not even very accurate right Yes. This is a very, very rough. Just hand waving right now, right? I haven't made a precise analogy at all. Yes. This is just to give you sort of an idea that, okay, well, there is a relationship between time evolution and Fourier transform. But that doesn't imply, one thing doesn't imply the other, right? What you're saying that you have to make the analogy precise before you can make a statement like that. Okay. Yes, sir. Okay. Any other questions? Uh, well, I have a question in Telegram from uh, one of the students. And the answer to your question is no, they will not give the same. Okay. All right. All right. So I guess I'll stop but it can here. Can you tell the question which, yeah. Uh, it's okay. It's, it's, it's not, not not that uh, important okay all right so again don't forget to like comment and subscribe and hit the bell button on your way out okay